Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. We thought we'd come out and do one of these neighborhood walk around tours that we've been doing on the channel with a kind of one that's about the signs of spring. Okay, and I thought this was a good spot to start out here in a full sun parking lot uh, with uh, a beautiful group of yellow pansies uh, out, out in full bloom. These may actually be panolas, which are a combination of violas and pansies. They typically have a slightly smaller flower like this, not as small as violas, but not as big as pansies. And it tend to be a little, they get the cold hardiness of the violas, but with the showiness of uh, pansies, but that's what it looks like. I love this yellow group, this solid yellow group. It's so showy. Um, and tulips are already emerging from the ground here. And so I don't know where you, you know, you live in the country, but our tulips have started to emerge. The ones that we have returning uh, in our garden are emerging. And this is definitely one of those signs of springs, right? All the bulbs coming out of the ground. So we're gonna walk around and find some other signs of spring. This is a really beautiful container in a very, urban space behind an apartment building and, and a shopping center. Uh, and they've just really done it up. Uh, there's a couple Deodore Cedars in this container, which, you know, reach 80 feet in height or something. So they're probably, they're not long-term inhabitants of this container, but they can certainly stay here for a year or two and then be used out in the landscape uh, somewhere else. But they're, they're, they're cold hardy enough to be able in this elevated container and freeze solid and not have, not have an issue. The container has beautiful pansies, violas occasionally a couple of these containers have some johnny jump ups in them there's a hookera uh, there are various carexes that they use uh, in these the dusty miller really looks beautiful uh, all winter long uh, there's an ornamental kale in the back there's ornamental kale and cabbages used uh, in these uh, various containers this lamium is really really striking we kind of struggle with lamium uh, at our house because a lot of our shade spaces are dry. This tends to like a slightly more moist soil. So I don't know if these are on some, I'm guessing they're on some, I don't know if they're on some sort of automated irrigation system or somebody I guess is coming in and watering these, but they're absolutely beautiful um, and, and chock-a-block full of color. We shot by Burnham Tynus over on NC State's campus in a tour video on NC State's campus, which is right beside where we're standing right now. And there was a Viburn there was a Viburnum Tynus next to some dumpsters, and, we, and uh, it had gotten, you know, very large. And it was in a super protected space. Uh, these are as well, but this is the best year I've seen for Viburnum Tynus in years. Normally, as these buds start to open, we get some sort of frost or freeze that knocks them back. Again, these are in a pretty protected space and they're in a little bit of shade, so they're stretching just a bit. You can see that how the growth habit of the plant is just kind of very vertical and, and stretching up a bit, but what a beautiful plant. I, I've always loved this plant. The, the texture of the leaves, the evergreen part, the red stems, the red flower buds that open to these you know, white flowers, the little kind of bluish uh, fruit that's on it after that. Just a lot going on for it, uh, for, for this plant. But again, typically, it's just one that starts too early. You, you, you gotta slow down a bit. Uh, uh, but this year's just been a great year for them. Almost everywhere we've gone that these have been planted, they're just out in full, you know, absolute full bloom. Again, these are a little in too much shade, so they're not quite as covered in flowers as you would see out in a little more sun. But of course, if they were out in a little more sun, they'd be less protected. So there's that balancing act, right? Here's a beautiful flowering quince. I love these white uh, flowering uh, quince. The neighborhoods around us tend to be old neighborhoods with a lot of shade. Uh, you know, long shadows and that kind of thing. And white really pops in darker, in darker spaces. These start off kind of a greenish hue to them and then they're, you know, solid white uh, once they open up. This one's probably eight feet tall. I don't know the variety of this white one. A lot of the breeding in quince has been to shrink them, shrink them, shrink them. Uh, but this one is uh, one that will get, it's obviously an older one. It'll get eight or nine feet tall. You'll get, um, these can kind of colonize over time but it's pretty easy if you're staying on top of it to not let them sucker everywhere and become that kind of colony. If you ever lose control of it, it's hard to you know, kind of regain control of it. It does have these kind of thorny uh, you know, thorns down in them. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you're doing a lot of pruning on them, uh, you know, it, can be, it can be wicked. So put on some gloves if you're messing with your quince. But if you've never had quince jelly, it's definitely worth a try if you run into that anywhere. It's a great uh, uh, jelly that can be made out of these. Got a star magnolia uh, starting to bloom. They're pretty much, they're normally the earliest of the uh, uh, 
deciduous magnolias uh, to bloom are the star are the star magnolias also one of the more fragrant of the deciduous uh, magnolias uh, the only problem with them again is almost almost every year uh, they're going to come out like this and you know even minor frost can sometimes damage them this one's in a protected space so i would imagine it's going to take something colder than 31 or 30 to actually hurt these open flowers so in a protected space out of the wind uh, they're probably going to more often than not get a beautiful flower show uh, out of this star magnolia. This is something you'll rarely see is a Daphne Adora that reaches the point where it's got to be hard pruned like a boxwood. Uh, this, this one's along a sidewalk in a neighborhood not far from us. Four and a half feet tall and again they have to run a shear across the side to keep it off the sidewalk. It's just found a spot that it absolute, absolutely loves. Generally speaking can be kind of short-lived uh, sometimes very short-lived. Uh, they need to be well, you know, well-drained soil. Um, you know, maybe the sidewalk is helping in some way. It's kind of surrounded by um, other things. But in absolute peak bloom uh, here on Valentine's Day, and uh, the fragrance is unbelievable. Beautiful foliage on Daphne. Um, great size and shape. Perfect little ornamental uh, plant. Great flowers, of course, at a time when other things aren't blooming. But again can be a little bit finicky. One thing I'd point out here is here's another use of this green spire euonymus, which I've never covered on the channel, but in a narrow space next to a sidewalk, doesn't require any pruning, but allows a little bit of height to buffer the house, you know, that's behind it. But man, you know, you just, this is a rare find. There was another variegated Daphne we, we were going to film that we saw the other day that's about this tall. And then we just ran up on these uh, and they're unbelievable. I've never, four and a half feet, by four and a half feet, something like that. A lot of the cherries have started to bloom. We've shown off Prunus mume, which is pretty much finished at this point. And now you have this still very early season cherries that go off. I think um, this darker pink one, I think is Okami. And then you'll find one that's kind of a more of a, a white with a little bit of a pink hue to it. Uh, that's Yoshino uh, that are pretty common. Uh, there are other varieties as well, so I may you know, I may be off on this, but I'm pretty sure this is Okami. I grew it for, I grew it for years. This one's in a tough spot. It's out here in the, uh, you know, this, we call this the hell strip between the curb and the uh, sidewalk here, and it's up in the power line. So eventually it's gonna need some tough love uh, up at the top as well. But they are one of those si early signs of spring. You know, you see why the, uh, the Japanese love them, you know, so much. It's, you know, the, you know, the, the coming of spring is what, what, what they determined. Then, I had a Kwanzaa cherry uh, at the old house, which is just a double version of this. It tends to hold off and bloom a little later, which prevents some of the cold damage that happens on some of these, you know, once they get these flowers completely open like this. If we were still in mid-February, we could definitely get a night that's still in the teens or low 20s or something like that. Unlikely, but possible, uh, that would damage the flowers. And Kwanzaa holds off a little, little longer than that. One thing I'll tell you that you wouldn't think, most of these ornamental trees, the roots aren't all that bad on them. But my ornamental cherry at the old house ran roots everywhere through my irrigation boxes, water lines, everything. It was just a really aggressive tree out in the landscape. So it's another one. Set it back from anything, you know, that you uh, are concerned about in that way. Of course, uh, not under the power lines either, probably. But, you, you know, they are one of those signs of springs. And I love, you know, love this time of year. Uh, and they bloom kind of sequentially you'll see the you know the mumes and then you know y yoshino and others and then eventually kwanzaan uh, will bloom and then that'll be the end of them and the foliage is out on them we put up a video on all about hellebores earlier in the week as you're watching uh, this video this is this one is part of the ice and roses series highly recommend these the foliage is beautiful as you can see the flowers are just unbelievable this one's in its third season so uh, it takes a while, but eventually, you know, you can have your hellebores looking like this. Uh, we have lots more in the garden. We mostly bought them as smaller plants, and it does take a while if you're, you know, trying to save money on hellebores. But finally, this is the results. We put, we, in the video, we talk about cutting the foliage back and several other details if you want to go back and take a look at that video. But absolutely love hellebores and definitely one of the great signs that uh, spring is coming. The little garden cart that we frequently use, you see in videos that we use to mulch and other things with. That there's so many plants in this garden that there's tight spaces and this little garden cart that we have is perfect for it. But uh, Steph got that off the side of the road. <laughs> She's pretty good at seeing deals, seeing the, seeing the freebies around the neighborhood and, uh, and, and, and grabbing them. 
Uh, these daffodils are included in that. We have several of these smaller daffodils. But I, don't, I don't know the uh, variety. We have tons of bulbs that we planted in the garden. A lot of them came from color blends. But then we have this collection, this really uh, neat one that's very vigorous, uh, very, has filled in very quickly into this little bunch. Uh, small, but incredibly bright daffodils. These are early, an early variety. This is one thing about daffodils. When you're thinking about adding uh, bulbs, daffodils, you know, if there's an opportunity, um, and, and there definitely is with daffodils, to get early, mid, and late blooming ones. Make sure you're reading that. If you're on the Color Blends website, it'll tell you whether it's an early blooming one, a mid blooming one, late blooming one. And try not to get all the same ones, you know, that bloom at the same exact time. Because we have some early ones that are just starting to go off, but there'll be daffodils out here blooming for about a month and a half because we have some late ones as well. But another one of Steph's free road vines. I definitely wish there was smell-o-vision here at the house as well. We've shown off the Daphne here in this video in full bloom. The uh, Edgeworthia is also uh, fully, you know, full-on incredibly fragrant right now. Uh, you see that yellow in the center and the white around the edge. There are some other colors of uh, Edgeworthia, but typically if you get straight, you know, the Edgeworthia chrysantha, you'll see this multicolor flower. The flowers are nodding. You can see they're all pointing downward uh, on this plant. Uh, they're about, they're past peak. Most of them are kind of expiring at this point. It's been blooming for several weeks, but some of them are still putting off quite a bit of fragrance. It's actually, you don't smell them all that much super early when they look a little fresher. It's as they're, uh, the, they're starting to decline that it really the fragrance uh, comes alive and it's mostly like 50, 60 degree afternoons uh, where we smell, smell them. But again, the flowers are nodding, they're pointing down. Uh, I would put one of these in a spot where you can actually let it get tall over time or put it up on a bank uh, slope. I talked about this in the hellebore video, these plants that have nodding flowers, if we can elevate them, uh, you know, we can, see, we can see the actual color in the flowers, but this will, you know, the flowers are finishing up now, the leaves will come out in a few weeks and the leaves look as fantastic as the flowers do, um, as the flowers are fragrant. One of my absolute favorite Camellia japonicas we planted two years ago uh, here in the garden in Raleigh is called Lemon Glow. Uh, these, we planted this, I think in the summer and that, fir that winter freeze we had December of 22 really knocked this thing back. Uh, it sat here all year last year, started to look a little better toward the end of the season. It's got six or eight flower buds on it right now, but they're undersized uh, as they're opening up. Lemon Glow is really neat because it starts out kind of a, with a green hue to it uh, and then gets this kind of lemony yellow in it and then and white as well. But these flowers will be this big in the future and they're super detailed and they have several different uh, kind of several different color transformations that happen in it over time. But this plant definitely took a beating uh, two years ago. I expect as uh, spring comes on here that now that it's settled into the you know, settled in well, that's going to uh, flush out. The other thing is there's a maple over here next to it that's also out competing it. So I think also having it rooted in will help. But this season, I expect it to really jump up and next year put on a show with these big, beautiful white flowers. Another great sign that spring is coming is definitely Pieris, Pieris japonica. Uh, they have these little nodding flowers, all these little ericace, a lot of these ericaceous plants, the uh, blueberries and other things have these similar kind of flowers, but uh, the Pieris do it on these racemes that hang down, uh, quite beautiful. This is Temple Bells. It's, it's, a, it's really a great plant, but we also have uh, Mountain Snow Pieris from the Southern Living Plant Collection. It has not started to show color yet, but it is a very, very full, vigorous plant on, on the back. Uh, on the back line and when it's in flower I'm sure it'll show up in a tour video but this uh, temple bells we planted from a very small container it'll it'll put on some new some good new growth after it flowers this year but it is uh, uh, it's the one showing color so here you go look how bright and showy those white flowers that are hanging down off of this PRSR after it finishes flowering it'll get red really vibrant red new growth and then it'll settle into green uh, over the course of the summer. P uh, Temple Bells and Mountain Snow can be kept on the smaller side, which is kind of nice, but they're always doing something during the growing season. 
you should definitely have smell a vision for this one. Uh, this is an intense, intense fragrance. Uh, this is the straight uh, Daphne Adora. Most of the Daphne that you'll see planted is, are variegated, sometimes with an outside white variegation, outside yellow variegation, sometimes with a center white or yellow variegation, lots of different ones. But this is the straight uh, Daphne Adora, the green uh, leaf variety. And another one that's four feet tall, four plus feet tall and four or five feet wide. Uh, it's got a large conifer growing behind it and some other things against it. It's just um, like a little, just a little meatball plant out here in this garden. And again, they're, they tend to be finicky. I guess planting them, walk away, and then occasionally, you know, occasionally prune the things off uh, is, the, uh, is the secret. But this thing is absolutely gorgeous, and we've caught it on a day that's probably peak bloom. We've shown Professor Sergeant Camellia a couple times uh, over the last a couple of these tour videos in the neighborhood because there's a lot of them in the neighborhood. But this one's probably over 20 feet tall. I'm six feet tall and you can see the scale of this thing. They planted it under an electric line and you think that a camellia wouldn't be a problem under an electric line and this one has actually reached uh, that point. Uh, again, super common variety, peony type, uh, that full center and then you get the, uh, the single petals around the outside of it. Uh, things bloom like mad. You'll get cold nights that'll knock the open flowers back, but then you have tons of buds that come out after them. But I really wanted to just include this one just to show you the scale of a Camellia japonica after probably 50 years uh, in the ground. It's all the way up into the electric lines. Came across one of my absolute favorite Camellias. This is Crimson Candles. I grew this one for years. It uh, puts on a, a, a giant show and it wears the flowers kind of on the outside. It's one of the longer blooming uh, camellias. Uh, easy to grow. This one was, I mean, I consider Sasanquas and Japonicas are, are not, they're not hard to grow. They're just super slow. This one tended to be a little bit more vigorous. When the new growth comes out on it, it's kind of a burgundy red color, slightly longer, narrower leaf than some of the other uh, varieties you'll see. It's just such a heavy bloomer. We've passed peak on this one a bit, so you're seeing a bit of faded flowers on it, although there are a few more buds opening up and it tends to be a little darker pink uh, as the new flowers emerge. And then down at the bottom of this thing, you'll always see this ring of flowers uh, around the bottom of it. It's one of the ways that I, I know it's uh, crimson candles from a distance because it drops them and they stay pink like this on the ground as it's kind of a skirt around it for a long time. Daffodils really starting to take off in the last week or so. And again, these are south facing. I point this out every time I talk about daffodils, the sun is tracking. You know, it's in my face right now. It's also in the face of those uh, daffodils. So they'll open up and then just face that direction to soak in as much of that sun as they can. Behind it, another great early sign of spring is the star magnolias. They tend to take some damage because they open the flowers up so early. But in a protected space under a tree right here, it's unlikely it'll get any frost on it. This one will, most years, probably perform pretty well. But the occasional winter, we'll get a night when the flowers are this open that will we'll knock them back. But unbelievable fragrance, great structure to that tree as it matures. The bark is beautiful. You know, so many great qualities, you know, in, in these magnolias beyond the fact that it's an early sign of spring with their bright, showy white flowers. Well, forsythia is definitely one of the signs of spring. You know, the, one of the earlier flowering things every year. Uh, these are some that we walk past all the time that are meat balled like this, and they'll get a few flowers and there's a few more flower buds coming, but a lot of the potential for this plant was taken away. It was planted originally so close to here, they have no choice because these are big weeping shrubs. So they really don't have any choice but to maintain it, you know, kind of like this at this point. There's a beautiful quince uh, flowering up Behind it, it's almost tree formed. That one's been left to get, you know, it's to its full height uh, behind it. The community watch program in the neighborhood does not give pruning recommendations, apparently. Apparently those two things are not, are not, are not connected. Uh, again, you know, it just happens. The, you know, it's kind of right plant, right place, right? It, you know, there's definitely would be a good idea on this corner with this property behind us to have some, because there's so much traffic, all the cars passing, road noise, all kinds of things going on. It is nice to have something here that's blocking this space, just not something that could end up, you know, out here in the middle of the, uh, of the sidewalk. But Forsythia, definitely one of the first signs of spring. There, of course, pretty much everybody in the country can grow them in some form or fashion. There are some smaller growing ones. There are variegated foliage ones. Uh, 
really interest, a lot of interesting varieties and a lot of plant breeding around this plant to shrink them down a bit, but this is definitely one that would get uh, big and leggy. And of course that quince definitely a sign of spring. So thank you guys so much uh, for following along with the videos. And if you're enjoying these garden walk around or neighborhood walk around videos, let us know down below. Thanks for watching.